Good morning, everyone, and welcome to worship here at King Covenant Church. Whether you're here in person or you're watching at home virtually, uh, it's good to be gathered together to worship God, to uh, give Him praise and to give Him thanks and to, and to just kind of get ready to be His people in this world. Before we get started, I have a few quick announcements for you. Uh, number one is that this is the Sunday that we normally have our open mic night. And because there's some sporting event that's going to last long this afternoon, a superb owl or something like that, uh, that is going to be canceled for this month, okay? So you can look forward to having it pop up again on our calendars in March. And also next, remind you that next week from noon until 2 o'clock, we're having a membership class here at Kent Cup. It's been a while since we had one, and we wanted to make sure that we could all meet together and uh, have a membership class. People are inquiring about that. It's, uh, it's a requirement for membership to come to the class, but you don't have to become a member. If you're just kind of curious about what Kent Covenant is and who are these people and what do they do, and, uh, just come on to the membership class. A free meal is involved. Okay, that's next Sunday. If you want to come, we'd like to know you're coming. So please uh, talk to me in the foyer or just contact the church office throughout the week. Also coming up in a couple of weeks is the annual congregational meeting on February 27th. That's two weeks from today. It'll be a Zoom meeting at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, and you do need to sign up to come. And if you want to vote, you have to have an individual email address. So couples, if you just have one email address and you both want to vote, you're going to have to get another email address and submit that. You can sign up online, and for more information, you can also look at our website, kentcub.org. But please, stand and let's begin our worship this morning. Thanks, Pastor Dan. <clears throat> what a beautiful day it is. Man, it's nice to have sun in February. Uh, uh, my name is Peter Goffold. I'm the Director of Worship and Arts here, and it is an honor and a privilege to be able to be here this morning to, to sing, to make music, to join our voices, to praise, to worship, to learn, to grow, to serve together. Uh, God is good all the time. All the time, God is good, and we get to proclaim these truths of who God is and his goodness in ways that make your toes tap. So feel free, loosen up your sandal straps if they're restrictive for potential toe tapping to come. Here we go. One, two, three, four. Oh. Lord, you are good. Lord, you are good. 
times where um, I'll come to my prayer and I'll stop and for us to pray on what has just been said. So let's bow our heads. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. As we come here today in fellowship with one another, setting aside this time just for you, to offer you praise and worship, to hear you speak to us to be in your holy presence. Lord, hear our prayers. Oh God, we thank you for those times this week where we smiled and laughed. Those times when we appreciated the beauty of nature when we felt spring coming on, when we felt at peace in our hearts, when we paused to be grateful for the life that you have given us, for all of these gifts and so much more, we know that we are blessed. And so in gratitude and in joy, we pray, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer.
for our days of difficulty and struggle, for the times when we have been less than our best, we give you thanks that you do not turn away from us and that we are never alone. In our struggles with sin and with the sin of this world, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Lord, we lift to you our church. We want to be used by you to make a difference in the lives of others, to make a difference in this world. So may you be present in us as we do the work that you have called us, that ministry of reconciliation and restoration, that ministry of the gospel of peace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. We lift up to you our country and its leaders. May they make decisions that honor truth and justice. Help us, Lord, to protect the weak and the powerless, the hungry and the homeless. And Lord, we pray for peace in this world during a time when we can see and hear the threat of war and violence. And so, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Lord, for those who are sick, suffering, lonely, misguided, or just in need of your presence, we ask that you would touch them with your healing, with your guidance, and with your peace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, as we continue to praise and worship you, open our hearts and minds to the truth of your word. Bless our worship and the offerings that we give for the building up of your kingdom. For we pray this in the name of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. so he could be heard better. Now, when he was done teaching, he turned to the fisherman who owned the boat, Simon Peter, and he told him to take the boat out further and let down his nets to catch fish. Well, that was a strange request because Jesus had asked to use his boat to teach the crowds on the shore. And also because Simon and his brother Andrew, they'd already been out all night trying to catch fish, and they hadn't caught any fish at all. But Simon trusted Jesus, and he did what he asked. And wouldn't you know it, they caught so many fish that they needed help from their friends in another boat. And when they were done, both boats were overflowing with fish. Well, Jesus then told them that from now on, they would be fishers of people. Well, they were all amazed, and Simon Peter, his brother Andrew, and their friends James and John, they all left everything they had behind, and they followed Jesus. This meant they became disciples of Jesus. Okay, disciple. The word disciple means being a follower, but most importantly, a learner. Those fishermen chose to live their lives following and learning from Jesus. Now when Jesus called the fishermen to follow him, people, they were surprised because as a teacher, people expected him to have students following and learning from him, not fishermen. This is really important, friends, because 
Jesus doesn't expect us to know everything in the Bible and know all the answers about who God is before we become his disciples. No, we just have to be willing to live our lives by always learning and following him. Sometimes Jesus asks us to follow him somewhere that's new, and that's like in our story. But other times, and I would say this is true for a lot of people, Jesus asks us to follow him right where we are. But if we aren't going to follow him to somewhere, how can we be following him? Well, that is a great question. So let's think of the games Follow the Leader and Simon Says. In Follow the Leader, you're moving around from place to place, right? And you're doing the same thing as the leader. In Simon Says, you usually stay in one place, but you're paying close attention to do, doing only the things that Simon Says. Well, in both cases, you're doing what the leader is doing. You're following them. So whether we go and follow follow him or stay put and follow him, Jesus just asks us to be willing to do either. So wherever we are, when we seek to continually learn about God and love him with our whole hearts and love others the way Jesus loves them, we are living as disciples of Jesus. All right, now next week, we are going to talk more about all those fish. I mean, there is a lot going on in that part of the story. And I don't mean just the boat loads of fish. <laughs> All right, friends, I will see you later, disciples. Oh, that's good. Thank you, Pastor Trina. I'm going to reveal a little uh, of my nerdy history. I took Latin in high school. I was part of the dead language club and everything. I was their treasurer. Anyways, our teacher, every every morning when we'd come to class, would say, good morning, discapuli, discapuli, which is the Latin word for students. And from that point on, like the word disciple meant so much more than it had before because it's it's exactly what Trina said of being a learner, being willing to learn. So now you know I took Latin in high school. I'm not ashamed. But at this time, I'd like to invite our Cancun kids. They're going to head to these doors back here to head to their workshops. And uh, parents, you're welcome to walk with them. And if you haven't already signed them in, it just takes a second out in the foyer. Uh, but as they go, church, let's sing this blessing over them. Go with God to play your part in the story. Go with God, bearers of God's glory. Go with peace to love and serve and song is a prayer, and I invite you all to, uh, to pray along with me as we sing.
Good morning, King Cove. Our text this morning comes to us from the Gospel of John, chapter 1, beginning in verse 9 through verse 18. It reads, I'm reading this morning from the Message Translation. The life light was the real thing. Every person entering life he brings into light. He was in the world. 
The world was there through him, and yet the world didn't even notice. He came to his own people, but they didn't want him. But whoever did want him, who believed he was who he claimed and would do what he said, he made to be their true selves, their child of God selves. These are the God begotten, not blood begotten, not flesh begotten, not sex begotten. The Word became flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood. We saw the glory with our own eyes, the one-of-a-kind glory, like Father, like Son, generous, inside and out, true from start to finish. John pointed him out and called, This is the one, the one I told you was coming after me, but in fact was ahead of me. He has always been ahead of me, has always had the first word. We all live off his generous bounty, gift after gift after gift. We got the basics from Moses, and then this exuberant giving and receiving, this endless knowing and understanding, all this came through Jesus, the Messiah. No one has ever seen God, not even, not so much as a glimpse. This one-of-a-kind God expression, who exists at the very heart of the Father, has made him plain as day. Please join me in prayer. Bless us this day, O Lord, with vision. May this place be a sacred place, a telling space, where heaven and earth meet. Amen. This morning we are concluding our series called The Deeply Formed Life. And I wanted to back up for just a couple minutes this morning and think about or talk about why it is that we did this series? Why have we been focused on these uh, ideas of what it means to have a deeply formed life? And then even further back, back to the beginning of last summer when we did a series called The Practices, which had to do with spiritual practices that we can use in our lives as we seek to become followers of Jesus. Why do we do that? Well, I think for me as a pastor, one of the most important needs that I see in our culture today is the need for us to be deeply formed in the way of Jesus. You see, I think with a church is struggling in this era in a lot of different ways. And one of the questions I had asked as I was preparing this sermon was this question, which I think anyone who takes following Jesus seriously wonders about, and that is this, how do we make a difference in the world and in our neighborhood? Now, the challenge for us is this, that we in the church, or many of us in the church, have, have essentially understood that there are only two options to the way this works. Now, don't get me started on dualistic thinking and, and the problem that is for us, right? Um, because that's a deep rabbit hole. But the reality is, is that oftentimes we think of uh, our world in a dualistic way, which means it's either yes or no, it's either black or white, it's either this or that, when most of us, if we're really gut level honest with ourselves, as we think about our lives, we recognize that there are all kinds of shades of gray. And there are all kinds of things that don't fit neatly into categories, as much as we would like it to be that way. And we have looked at the world around us, and we have come up with essentially, uh, and this is a gross overgeneralization, I know that, so, you know, just 
Put that aside for a second and recognize that in the church, generally, we have come up with two solutions to this question of how we make a difference in the world. The first solution is that we chase after political and cultural influence. And we seek to uh, have power in our culture so that we can legislate or enforce our understanding of the way the world should be. And the hard reality is, is that for centuries, the church in America had a place of privilege, right? I had a, a question asked of me recently, um, and I'm supposed to write a, an essay about it. The, uh, is the church in America under attack? It's going to be a short essay. <laughs> the answer is no. Right? At least not by who you think it is. You know, the reality is, is that we have fallen, we've, we've spent so long, friends, in this culture war mentality. That culture is something to be won, fought for, that we're to impose ourselves, that we're to, um, you know, enforce our morality and our understanding of scripture and all of that on our culture. Right? Now let me just give you a little window into my thinking on this. If we read the Gospels carefully, which we should, there is someone in the story that looks like that. That someone is not Jesus. Right? We don't see Jesus striving for power and influence and to seeking to impose things on people. Who do we see doing that? The Pharisees. Right? Now, that's not what this sermon is about, and I could easily go on forever about it, but that's one reality, right? We have this idea, and we've talked about it in the church for years, this culture war mentality of, like, we're going we're gonna to enforce, we've got to stop this, you know, secular humanism and all the different things, right? And we somehow have gotten into the idea that we can do that through influence and, and um, Washington and all those things, Right? The second approach that we generally fall into is what, if you've been around the church for a long time, you will hear people use phrases like, well, they're just social gospelers. They just believe in the social gospel or whatever. And so then, and partly that comes from the opposite reaction. The opposite reaction and solution is that we should just do, uh, have radical activism and service and all that kind of stuff in the church, and that's all we should focus on. Right? It's that either or. When in reality, as we talked about in the series, when we talked about who we are as covenant people, we believe and affirm the whole gospel. Which means it's not either or, it's both and. We proclaim the gospel, we live the gospel. We seek to be people of Jesus. And so, how do we make a difference in the world is that we become formed in the way of Jesus. Are we being formed in the way of Jesus or are we being uh, or are the ways our ways of understanding the church forming us or is something else forming us? We're all, as I've said before, being discipled. The only question is by whom? Right? The only question is by whom? I love that this theme came up through the children's message and, and what Peter said about uh, taking Latin, that's gold. Um, but it's interesting because it struck me as I was listening to that, but speaking just for me, growing up in the church, going to a Christian college and on to seminary, I always heard, when I heard the word disciple and the, that idea of, being, well, being a disciple means being a lifelong learner, right? Well, I translated that into knowing all the things in my head. Knowing all the right verses, knowing all the right theology, knowing the right doctrine, believing the right things in the right way, in the right order, right? And all of that has a place, but it, I would argue that what we're talking about when, we, when Jesus says, come and follow me, He's not saying, come and think the way I think. That will happen naturally. What he is saying is, come and learn 
the Jesus way of life. Come and be formed and approach the world and your neighbor the way that I do it. Right? So that we don't then um, seek to be a missional presence. We don't seek to change our neighborhoods and our world by enforcing our thinking on people. We do it by taking on flesh and moving into the neighborhood, just like Jesus did. Now the challenge for us, friends, is that's slow, tedious work. And we in the church, like everybody else, love things to happen fast and to happen in big, expansive ways, right? We love to be able to point at, at the church that's like, oh, well, look at that church. That church is really growing. They are growing leaps and bounds. They are adding people like crazy. And my question, my immediate question is always, but are they forming disciples? We don't know what the fruit of that growth will be. Right? So we do these things. We slow down and we hear the word and we do these practices to be formed into the image of Jesus. One other rabbit trail on that one is if you think about, you know, our fascination with fast and quick and, um, you know, measurable results and all of those things. And there's a place for all of that, right? But when you think of when Jesus described the kingdom, right? Isn't it fascinating that he did not describe it the way that, you know, we probably would? Because you think about the parables he told. The kingdom of God is like a megachurch. <laughs> the kingdom of God is like something that's huge and powerful. Or he could have said the kingdom of God is like the Roman army, right? It just is powerful and it does all these. No. The kingdom of God is like yeast. The kingdom of God is like a mustard seed. The kingdom of God is small, and it starts small, but once it starts, there's no stopping it. It goes, and it goes, and it goes. So what does it mean for us to be formed in that way? I want to focus on just a couple verses in this passage that we read, which I love, John 1 is one of my favorite chapters of Scripture. I just, it's such powerful uh, language, right? But I want to focus on verses 12 and 13 because I think it gives us a key um, to understand how it is that we at least begin to be formed. John writes, But whoever did want him, who believed he was who he claimed, and would do what he said, he made to be their true selves, their child of God selves. So pause there for a second. Whoever did want him, he gave the power, he made them to be their true selves, their child of God selves. So what happens in that invitation of Jesus taking on flesh and moving into the neighborhood and us recognizing the truth in him, right, being drawn to that truth and that love, what happens then as we accept that gift is that we are made to be our true selves. The broken image of God, the image of God that's in us but broken by sin, is repaired. It is made whole, and we become a part of that ever-expanding kingdom, right? Now, he's careful to point out, though, and this is fascinating because I think it's, it, it shows one of our um, just deepest human tendencies. So he says this, that, that if we um, believe who he claimed to be and that he would do what he said, that he'd make us our true selves. And then he goes on to say, these are God-begotten, not blood-begotten. Not flesh begotten, not sex begotten. Right? So let's break that down just real quick. These are God begotten. In other, ways, in other words, this is the work of God in us. It is not our work. 
We don't choose to do it. We don't do it under our own power. We don't earn it. We don't any of it. It's God begotten. It is God's work in us. Step one. It's kind of interesting. I've always found it fascinating that that particular step in, in the life of faith, there's a reason why the 12-step 12 12 12 step programs are so powerful. And one of the reasons is, is that they start with step one is admitting you have a problem. Admitting that it's not yours. You can't do it, right? So, um, next one, not blood begotten. In other words, it's not because you were born into a particular family or ethnic group or tribe or race, right? There's nothing, there's no blood that makes it, you know, makes you acceptable or makes you into a child of God. Not flesh begotten. In other words, it's not under your own effort. It's not a work of the flesh. It's not something you do. It's not something you can accomplish. It's not something you can earn under your, you know, your own effort in your body. And it is not sex begotten. It's not born, in, in other translations, it's not born of the desire of a husband or something. They say it that way, which is maybe problematic on some other ways. But the reality is, is that it's not because you're not in the family of God. You're not made, you're not, um, uh, made into your true selves because your parents decided that they wanted to have children. Right? In other words... When all else fails, go back to step one. This is the work of God. This is the gospel, right? These two verses are the gospel in poetry. That, that the, the gospel, that those who might believe in him and become children of God, enjoy eternal life and become a part of the kingdom of God because God made it so. Because God offered it. Now here's the other piece of this. This is good news, friends. This is, this is the good news of the gospel for all of us. Because the reality is, is that if it isn't the work of God, that, that there's none of us that were born into the right group. None of us were born into the right tribe, into the right ethnic group, into the right whatever, you know, whatever your particular fascination is. That's not it. It's not going to get you there. You're not going to earn it. And the, more, and the harder you try to earn it uh, under your own steam or by your own efforts, by being a good person, by following the rules, by following the law, all that it's going to do is make you the most insufferable person your family knows. <laughs> and it's not because your parents decided that they uh, loved each other enough to have a kid. None of that. The second part of this that's so important is that if you follow the arc of the story, from the very beginning, this has never been about just you, right? Here's one of the dangers of the way that we do faith, is sometimes the way we talk about this makes it all about us personally. And we, we turn into these kind of myopic, um, self-focused people. And faith is just about me getting to heaven when I die. That's not the point of the story, friends. Read, start at the beginning, read all the way you know, to Revelation. The, the point of the story is God putting all things right and restoring the creation to the way it was supposed to be. Right? So the, this adoption, this new creation reality that we're talking about in these two verses, this blessing was not meant for us to keep for ourselves, but for us to instead be transformed by, that Jesus, but by the fact that Jesus took up flesh and moved into the neighborhood and then move into the neighborhood ourselves. And share that blessing and that presence with a broken and hurting world. Friends, the reason the culture war has failed is because that was never the way of Jesus to begin with. The way of Jesus is to humbly come into the neighborhood and love 
people in, and to share God's love in such a holy and transforming way that it's irresistible. It's not about power. It's not about coercion. It's about love and grace and mercy. Then it goes on in verse 14 to say how um, Jesus takes up, moves into the neighborhood. And in other translations, it talks about made his uh, dwelling among us, right? And the idea here is um, that God in Christ is, you know, I love that you just can't improve on Peterson's translation of this. That Jesus took on flesh and moved into the neighborhood. The allusion here is to the Old Testament. It's to Exodus. When God took up uh, residence in the tabernacle. In the pillar of cloud uh, by day and the pillar of fire by night and the holy of holies in the tabernacle, right? And God tabernacled. He tented among them. And God's presence moved with his people through the wilderness, right? That's the image. That's the callback here. Now, next week we're starting a new series called The Exodus. And we're going to be looking at the themes, not just, we're not going to go through Exodus chapter by chapter, but we're going to look at the themes of the event of the Exodus, and some of those themes will be law and um, leadership. And um, one of them will probably be this, this idea of tabernacle, that God took up, you know, took residence up among his people. Jesus is the ultimate fulfillment of that residence. So, so when God takes up flesh and moves into the neighborhood, we are transformed by that. That's what this text is telling us. And so then the question of how is it that we make a difference in our neighborhood and in our world? Friends, I think sometimes we, we vastly overcomplicate this. We want to make it about programs. We want to make it about right belief, right theology, whatever, you know, all those things. And again, please don't hear me saying that those things are not important. They are important. But everything has to stay in its order, right? All things in good order. You know, it's like, um, so we do this, and we, we turn it into something that um, it was never meant to be. In part, because we like to see things happen quickly and in very measurable fashion, right? So we can feel good about how much we're impacting the world for Christ. But imagine that Jesus took on flesh and moved into the neighborhood in Palestine under Roman occupation. And he gathered around him the very best and brightest uh, MIT Hebrew students he could find. No. He took on flesh and moved into the neighborhood and he gathered disciples who were fishermen and tax collectors. You see, it happens slowly, and that's the challenge. The other challenge is this, is that it happens in relationship. It happens in relationship, and it happens out of hospitality. These are two practices that take inordinate amounts of time, and you often do them for a long, long time before you see any results. But we're so addicted to these programs and these ideas of how it is that we make disciples. And we wonder why people feel, you know, we, we don't seem to be able to get any um, traction with them. And the reason is, is that because our culture has developed a very high, highly tuned sense of being marketed to. Can you imagine that? Right? And so when we operate in such a way that they pick up even the hint of a whiff of being a target, they are not interested, thank you very much. But if they know that you are interested in them, not for what they might become, but simply because they are a person made in the image of God and they happen to live in your neighborhood or you happen to meet them at Target or whatever it is, you will earn a hearing. 
you will be invited into that relationship. Now here's a challenge for us. We recognize that we live in one of the most isolated times. You know, it's like we are more connected than any generation in history, and yet we are lonelier and more isolated than we have ever been. I'm convinced that so, that a big part of what is feeding this frenzy and craziness in our world of conspiracy theories and all of that crap, right? A huge part of what's pumping air into that fire is loneliness and isolation. We're not in community. Saw a news story this week out of Italy. Maybe some of you saw it too. Of um, This is horrific, but it's a, just, I think, a, a metaphor for where we find ourselves, not just here in the States, but around the world. Of An elderly woman was found in her home in Italy, sitting at her dining room table, mummified. She'd been dead for two years. Nobody knew. Nobody knew. She had no family. She had no you know, connection with the, you know, the neighbors thought she had moved away because of COVID. Um, you know, they went to do a, a check because there was a storm coming and found her. And I thought, man, that is so intensely sad. But it's such a picture of where we find ourselves. We are so isolated. Friends, we're so isolated, and, and I am convinced that this, while something that desperately needs attention in a lot of different ways, there's an opportunity for us here to announce the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ if we will simply take the time to take on flesh and move into our neighborhoods. Pastor Rich Viodas, whose book we loosely base this series on, says this. He says, as Jesus perfectly modeled, we are called to open ourselves to joining the journeys of others, building relationship, discerning openness, and announcing the news of God's loving presence and commitment toward them. This is not cookie-cutter evangelism, and we will find ourselves unsure of how to move forward. But this is the nature of faith, of faith isn't it? Friends, I will tell you this. When I have conversations with people outside of the church and they find out that I'm, I'm a pastor, I will hear generally one of two reactions. One is I will hear a story of deep woundedness, of how the church deeply wounded this person and how they left. And sometimes it's deep sadness that that story is shared with, sometimes it's anger, I mean, all the emotions that go with that, right? Makes sense. Um, the other reaction I get is uh, just, you know, they have no connection to the church. They've never been involved in a church. They don't, their family didn't go to church. They don't really know anything about it. So it's just irrelevant because they just don't have any context for it. Right? Those are the two responses. But what's interesting is that across those responses, at least in my very unscientific research, is there is, a, there is a, a deep wonder and a deep curiosity for Jesus. You start telling them, you know, if you listen carefully and you engage them in conversation and you start to build that relationship, you know, I found myself, I could, find, I could share a story like a parable without saying, well, this is a parable from, from Luke chapter 6, right? Just tell the story, and they'd be like, their eyes get big, they get totally drawn in, and then you just, well, yeah, that, Jesus told that story. And it's about this. All, we just have to pay attention and be willing to be uncomfortable and to be in relationship. Friends, maybe instead of demanding a hearing, which is the posture that generally we, the church at least is perceived to have taken in the world, I'd say that's an earned perception. Uh, instead of demanding a hearing, what if we focused on earning a hearing where we live, work, and play? What if we focused on building relationships, not so that we can say, oh, I convert, you know, somebody, you know, so that we can convert them, but simply so we can love them because that's what God has called us to do in the greatest commandment. 
So friends, part of this is all to say the reason we talk so much about the deeply formed life and we talk so much about practices is because it is in doing these things and in practicing these things that we become formed into the way of Jesus. And then we learn to live our life in a way that allows us to build relationships and to determine what the next right step is so that we might build those relationships and, and earn that hearing. The temptation or challenge for us, particularly, I think, as uh, evangelical Christians, is that we tend to fall on, in one category in particular, if we go back to verses 12 and 13, and it's that not flesh begotten phrase. We fall into a, a, into a habit of thinking that we can accomplish it. We can accomplish this life of faith so that, the, so that the, the practices become a checklist, right? Well, I did that. You know, okay, creation care, got it. Yep. Uh, prayer, got it. Yep. You know, I, and we think that once it's one and done, right? But the reality is that these practices are not a checklist to be accomplished. They're there to form us. And so my challenge for you as you seek to be formed in the, in the way of Jesus, if you want to make a difference in the world and in your neighborhood, it's to allow yourself to be formed into that way of Jesus. And the way we do that is through spiritual practices. So there may be, um, this is the place where you ask yourself, where are the gaps in my life? Maybe you find yourself in a season of life where you feel disconnected from God. Well, then maybe the practice that you need is Lectio Divina, and you need to spend time just in the Word, just hearing the Word, not trying to you know, do all kinds of in-depth Bible study, but to just hear the words of Scripture. Or maybe it's to pray a breath prayer over and over again until you uh, really feel God's presence in your life. Or one of the other ones. I mean, it just depends on where you find yourself in life. But we don't do these things to accomplish something. We do them to allow God's Spirit to come into us, to form us, so that we might become, as you've heard me say so many times now, so that we might become God's people for the sake of the world. Amen. It's a challenging word. Um, I'm always encouraged by the fact that it's uh, through the power of God that it happens, not through my own strength. And so as we uh, end our time today, I invite you to stand as we sing and ask God, God to renew our, our church and, and our work in the world.
Brothers and sisters, receive the benediction. Go now into your life where you live, work, and play, knowing that you are loved by God the Father, that you have been redeemed by the grace of Jesus Christ, and that you are empowered now and always by the Holy Spirit to share that love and grace with a broken and hurting world. Go and be Jesus' people.